Hello! Welcome to the Introduction to Proofs video for Induction and Recursion. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to distinguish between explicit and recursive descriptions of sequences, and you should be able to prove a statement about a recursively defined sequence using induction. The motivation for this is that we want to describe a sequence of real numbers, a1, a2, a3, etc. We want to describe them locally. Now, locally here means that if you have, uh, say, the hundredth term, I want to be able to define the next term from it. So using the information you have, describe the next one. This is different from describing a function explicitly like x squared or x cubed or sine x or something, where you just plug in the value and get it. When we're defining things locally, we want them to depend on the things that are close to them. So that's what locally means. The other motivation is that induction and recursion are two sides of the same coin. So they're related in a very close way. You use induction to prove statements about recursion. Induction is the proof technique, recursion is the definition. Let's look at an example of a recursively defined sequence. So let's define a1 to be the number 6 and define an plus 1 to be 5 times an plus 1 for all n. Another way of looking at this is if you have an already, the way you get the next one, so one index higher, is by taking 5 times the previous one and adding 1 to it. So this tells us how to get all of the new information and this tells us where to start. So let's see an example of this. So a1 is equal to 6, that's just given to us, that's our starting point. And now a2 is a1 plus 1. So the definition tells us use n equals 1 here. So I use n equals 1 and this is 5 times a1 plus 1. And we know what a1 is already, it's 6. So plugging this all in we get 31. Now can you tell me what a3 is? a3 is 5 times a2, and a2 is 31. We just computed that. Now, let's look at how to compute a number in two different ways. So I want you to compute a10 um, in two ways. First, use the recursive definition, compute a4, and then a5, and then a6, all the way up to a10. And then the second way I want you to do it is use the explicit definition of the sequence. In other words, plug in n equals 10 and see what you get. Take a moment right now, pause the video, and compute using both of them, and time yourself approximately how long it takes you to do both. Okay, take a moment now. Now, when I computed these on my own, the first one took me about 90 seconds, and the second one took me about 10 seconds. This is quite the difference. This should really show you how these two things feel very different. For this first one, it took so long because you had to compute everything along the way. You needed to compute a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, a6, a7, a8, a9, and then you could compute a10. But in the explicit definition, you can just plug in a10. You just plug in n equals 10 and you get the answer. So again, this is why these two things should feel very different. Now, a question you might have is, uh, well, you should have two questions. One, where did this formula come from? And two, is this formula correct? So we're not going to answer the first one, where it came from. That's for a different course. But we will answer, why is it correct? So let's prove that all of the an really do satisfy this equation, that this is a formula for them. Now, to do this, what does a proof mean in this case? Well, it means we need to show that a1 is of this form, a2 is of this form, a3, etc. So let's prove this by induction. For the base case, note that if you plug in n equals 1, by doing some algebra you get 6, which is indeed a1. So here on the left-hand side we computed algebra, and then once we got to 6 we realized, oh yeah, this is right. Now let's prove, by, uh, let's prove the induction step. 
So as usual, assume that an is of this form for a particular natural number, and we're going to show that an plus 1 is also of the right form, but obviously for n plus 2 instead. Now our goal is to show something about an plus 1, but we can't assume that it's of the right form because that's what we're trying to prove. But what do we know about an plus 1? Well, we know that an plus 1 is of this form. This is the definition. So we're allowed to use the definition. So let's use it right now. Next, what can we replace in this, in this 5 an plus 1? Do we know anything about an? Well, we know exactly one thing. We know that it's of this form. So we replace it. This plus one should be outside the bracket. Sorry about that. Because we replaced an with the term it is. So this is our induction hypothesis. And now from here on in, it's uh, manipulating it and simplifying it. So we'll go through this relatively quickly. We distribute the five. So we distribute the 5 through here. Again, remember this bracket should not be here. And then we put it under common denominator and get what we want. So let's just remember this bracket should be right here. This bracket is not correct. So what we've done is we've shown that an plus 1 is of this form, which is what we want. And let's look at how the steps went. The first thing we did was we used the definition of an, an plus one, I should say. And then we used the induction hypothesis because we knew something about an. And then from there on in, it was algebra. This is going to be a very common um, uh, thread. This is how most of these proofs will look. One of the first things you'll do is you'll use the definition. Now, for our final example, let's look at the Fibonacci numbers. So the Fibonacci numbers you may have seen are the numbers 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, etc. And they're defined by, if you want to get a number, you add up the two previous ones. So we got 8 by adding up 5 and 3. And then to get 13, it's 8 plus 5. And to get 21, it's 13 plus 8. So what's the next Fibonacci number here? It's 13 plus 21, which is 34. So this is a recursively defined sequence, but it's recursively defined in terms of the two previous things. So the definition for that is f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 1. These are the base cases if you want. And then f of n plus 2 is f of n plus 1 plus f of n. To put it another way, f of n plus 2 is the sum of the two previous things. So f of 5 is f of 4 plus f of 3. Now we're going to be using the Fibonacci numbers. There's tons and tons of interesting stuff about them, but we're going to look at one thing. And before we continue, I want to mention that the Fibonacci numbers were not invented by Fibonacci. Um, he introduced these numbers to Europe in his book Liber, Ab Liber Abaci. Um, so he introduced them to Europe, but they were well known outside of Europe uh, before that. So you can listen to a podcast about this, um, and I'll link it in the description. Um, the book Liber Abaci was also very interesting because it uh, did a bunch of other cool things that are important in math. Um, so you should really read about it. It's very neat. So we're going to prove one particular theorem about the Fibonacci numbers, which is that they're all bounded above by 2 to the n. So we're going to proceed by induction, and for reasons that will become clear in a moment, we're going to skip the base case for the moment. So this is not a good way to represent this proof, but I'm presenting this proof in a way that helps explain why we're doing things, like why we're making certain assumptions. So the induction step is assume that fn is less than 2 to the n for a particular n. So this is the usual thing. And now we're going to prove a bound on f of n plus 2. So that's the next one. 
Now by definition, f of n plus 2 is f of n plus f of n plus 1. So nothing interesting there. But now the question is, how, what sort of induction hypothesis stuff can we use? Well, we can use that f of n is less than 2 to the n. That's fine. But what do we know about f of n plus 1? Well, we don't really know anything yet. So in order to get a bound on this, we need to use, we need to make an assumption about it. So we're actually going to make two assumptions, that f of n is less than 2 to the n, and f of n plus 1 is less than 2 to the n plus 1. So we're making two induction hypotheses. Um, now, in this case, now we have bounds on f of n and f of n plus 1. And our goal is to show that this whole thing is less than 2 to the n plus 2. This is a little bit of algebra, but eventually you'll get it. So you factor out the 2 to the n, and then you, the, you use the fact that 3 is less than 4. So what's our base case in this case? Well, actually, we have two base cases, n equals 0 and n equals 1. For n equals 0, we get f of 0 is 0, which is less than 2 to the 0, and f of 1 is 1, which is less than 2 to the 1. Now, a common question is, why did we have two base cases? Well, the answer is because in our induction in our induction step, we made two induction hypothesis assumptions. So because we need to go back two steps, then the base case should have two base cases. It gives us two things to start from. Uh, one way of thinking about this is when you define the Fibonacci numbers, you need two starting cases so that you can go up to the next one. So you gotta start with two things. Here are some exercises for you. Prove that the nth Fibonacci number is actually less than or equal to 2 to the n minus 1 for all non-negative integers. Then prove that the nth Fibonacci number is less than 1.7 to the n minus 1. So actually improve the bound from 2 to 1.7. Your third exercise is to do even better than 1.7. So find something else that works. If you keep following this thread, you'll discover something very interesting. Finally, find an upper bound for the Tribonacci numbers, where they're defined in a very similar way, except you add up the three previous numbers. Now let's take a moment to reflect. What are the differences between a recursively defined sequence and an explicitly defined sequence? Define your own recursive sequence and see what happens to it. See if you can get any bounds on it. Okay, thank you very much and have a great day.